So hello and thank you for joining me today to hear about something that I've quite clumsily called um, technology viability and innovation, the importance of trying everything. So um, to start off with, a little bit of an introduction to who I am. So I'm Colin Dart, I'm the technology manager for Set Squared Exeter and I can often be found, as you can see in that picture, pointing at things and probably saying and so on and so forth and I'm sure it will crop up today. So. A little bit about um, who Set Squared Exeter are, um, just for context. So Set Squared Exeter are a regional business support um, provider, providing acceleration services to um, Devon startups and SMEs, just trying to help them um, grow and scale um, those who work in the high tech, high growth um, arena. And my role within that organization is to evaluate, support and guide um, our members and clients through their journey, um, coming across their challenges and their opportunities using my own knowledge and expertise but also physical resources such as the technology exploration lab which I'll talk about in a bit um, which is sometimes called the TEL access to experts um, and partners such as universities fab labs and the community so one part of that is the technology exploration lab so this is a physical resource up here at RHQ at um, Science Park, which is where I am today. Um, and it has a range of software and hardware resources um, such as VR kit, high powered computing through to 3D fabrication and electronics. The space has been designed to um, incorporate part of the process that we're going to talk about today, um, hence why it's worth noting. So on a more personal note, um, why do I do what I do? Um, I absolutely love seeing success in the technology and innovation arena. I often get incredibly carried away, very passionate and involved with what our clients are doing. Um, and, and as a result, I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly um, as to when it comes to um, founders getting carried away. So before I start the talk proper, um, I just wanted to say that in the chat, I'll put my contact details, a copy of this slide deck and also a copy of um, my uh, talk draft so that if you want to open these separately maybe read them back to yourself that's absolutely fine and also if you want to make contact um, I would absolutely love you to so before I talk about the theory um, of my talk today um, it's good to introduce it with with what the problem is so essentially um, it's a well-worn problem um, when we believe we have an idea we often design and create our innovation in isolation. We kind of stay within our comfort zones, um, utilizing the expertise that we have available to us, um, which is usually our own. Um, and what this does is this kind of avoids challenge and input from outside our echo chamber. So I've put it up there as a as trying to be succinct, designing and creating in isolation, um, staying within the boundaries of our own expertise. Now, it's not to say that this is wrong, um, there are some incredibly talented people with lots of expertise and experience. It's just that it adds a great um, amount of risk of failure, um, in particular leading to, as I've alluded to there, under, underdeveloped or inaccessible um, creations. And you can chart a long list of these potential failures. Um, and so this isn't exclusive, but poor market analysis, so not knowing your users, a lack of technology exploitation, you know, why are you using the code that you're using, the delivery mechanisms? Is it just because you know how to already? Um, really key one um, and very, very appropriate for today's talk, inappropriate UX and UI. Um, you know, is it basically just not accessible um, as, a, as a product? Also inaccessible release channels. Um, I often talk um, with some of my clients about technology philosophy. There's no point um, designing a solution to a poverty driven problem and then only allowing it to be used on the latest iPhone, for example. Um, and also a skewed value proposition. You know, um, you've done this in isolation. Is it actually a problem or is it only your problem? Um, and what this means is we can often be creating something that isn't fit for purpose, but also isn't really a solution or isn't the right solution. Um, and to stretch that out a bit, maybe it's not the right solution for the right people in the right way. So it could be that you're in the, on the right track, but not, not quite there. Now this can lead to some really obvious ones and I've put them on the slide, time, cost and quality issues. You know, you spend a lot of time on something that might not be pertinent. 
you might have to spend cost redoing it and also the quality might diminish. But what this can also lead to is kind of a disenfranchised or unsatisfied audience, um, which ultimately is failure um, because without your audience, your product goes nowhere. It's not a success. And to contextualize that to the theme of today's talk um, or rather conference, accessibility isn't someone else's problem. If you don't make your product accessible, it will most likely not work and that results in your failure. So if that's the problem, what's the solution? Well, I've tried to summarize it a little bit. Um, essentially, our ability to innovate is dictated by um, the kind of data and computational resources that we have available to us. So if we can increase that data and increase that resource, we're, we're increasing the likelihood of innovating to a high quality. Um, and to put it bluntly, what that really means is that we have to get out of our comfort zone and into other people's. And I've, again, I've summarized on the slide, engage with others to provide the views that we can't provide. So, and this is by no means an academic principle um, or theory. It's just my kind of um, four lines of advice, if you will. Um, first and foremost, socialize your idea. Something that needs to be done up front, early and, and all the way through. And I'll allude to that in our case study. Um, so that you can kind of get that kind of validation early on, but also you can explore new ideas. What does that mean though? That means seeking an audience with your peers, you know, um, seeking an audience with your intended audience. And also maybe those unrelated to your journey because you never know where it might take you. And now I've put a little diagram there. I spent far too much time on it. Um, the arrows are going one way because at the moment what you're doing is you're, you're talking to people about what you're doing. Tell them the what's and the why's and the how's of what you're doing to see you know, what they kind of come back with. You will be blessed with upfront validation or not, constructive criticism um, that can help you understand if you're on the right path, um, but also lead you to those really, really valuable conversations where you know, it might add value or richness to your proposition. The key is that these aren't formal. Um, you know, this is a chance for people to give you their informal views to kickstart ideas that you might have. The dream is that someone gives you the what if. What if you did this? Uh, oh, great. That's a great idea. I need to explore that. That could be amazing. But at a minimum, they'll tell you that don't forget. Don't forget to do this. Don't forget to incorporate this. Because if we think about things like accessibility, um, it's those people that can give you that. You can't give it to yourself. So the next bit really is to um, seek contribution and evaluation. Now, again, it's a process that happens throughout and it can take many forms, um, but really the aim is to provide you with that kind of level of governance um, for your own work, but also the work that you're guiding other people to do. Now, governance is a bit of a dirty word and there is some of what we consider the dirty element of, of governance. And, it, and that is really important, but ultimately this is also about your trying to make sure that your end product and what you do to get there stands true to everything that you've just um, socialized. Um, there's no point taking those valuable ideas and information and data and not properly incorporating it. And you'll see from the, um, from the diagram, the arrows are now going two ways because now they're giving you something. They're not just giving you their views, they're, they're giving you contribution. This could be focus groups, working groups, user groups, whatever it is, it's a chance for you to incorporate that valuable data. Now, you may already sense by the theme of the talk, um, the, the greatest element here is that you have to be a little bit uncomfortable with that as well, because you have to kind of listen and take heed. You know, this isn't lip service. This is your chance to, to maybe people to give you home truths about what you're doing, but also give you the kind of what you didn't think about. And that can look like anything. You know, have you got a compatibility plan? Um, how are you going to deliver this to the visually impaired, but still give the same value? Why are you using that code base? Because no one else does. Um, what does your audience expect? Because I don't think you've spoken to them. Um, and so on and so forth. See, I told you I would put it in there. Now, it would be really, really easy to see all of these points as negative, And I've chosen them for that reason. But in reality, you're trusting these people to give you problems. And from those problems, you can create solutions and that's just adding more and more value to your end proposition. 
So now we follow tangents. Um, and again, lovely little diagram, science. Of course it is. So what does this mean? Well, in my line of work, I've been blessed to have conversed, worked with, worked for, seen um, incredible experts deliver wonderful information about um, innovation. You know, the kind of expertise that not alone on their own, but together would just create a tour de force of, of you know, um, a library of information. And collectively, there's a strand that's always been there, which is you cannot innovate in isolation with your blinkers on. You need to take those blinkers off, start looking sideways, look at cross sector, look at cross users, look at other technologies to provide the same thing. Look at how someone else might be doing something for something that isn't actually even your problem. You know, just keep following those tangents. And that's the trying everything that I've spoken about. Um, and really what you might be doing here is you might be finding a couple of things. One is you might be looking for that eureka moment. I'll get onto that one in a sec. But two, you're exploring things that might get incorporated into your process or your innovation and make it better. But the way you explore it is to look at everything. So for example, and I'll give you a little example about this, you might be making something and you might think 3D printing, everyone's talking about it, not had much to do with it. What, what does it do? I'd like to see if it could make my product for me or if I could make my product from it. And you might explore it and get to grips with it. And, and, and when I say that, I mean really do it not just ask people about it. And you might say, no, it's not for me. It's too costly. Um, the quality isn't quite what I'm looking for, the strength, so on and so forth. But what it might do is it might say, although, although I can't use it, it's going to be really, really useful in the rapid prototyping stage because I don't have to send things off. I don't have to ask someone else to do it. I can do all of this. And then when I finally get to the end, there'll be another way of doing this. So you've learned and you've incorporated. But you could also have that massive eureka moment that kind of real, I wasn't thinking about that, but I've just invented something. Um, and that becomes the great innovation. And I got an example of this. It's not directly linked because he wasn't going out looking for it, am I, as I'm suggesting, but it, it makes sense. So Swiss engineer, um, George de Mistral, probably saying that wrong. Um, he's the inventor of Velcro. Now, he did this by, I wouldn't say chance, very intelligent person. But he used to take his dog for a walk. One particular um, way that he'd take his dog for a walk, um, the dog was coming back with seed pods attached to it. Um, he was annoyed by this, but at the same time was intrigued. Now he's an engineer, he's an inquisitive mind. He put those seed pods under a microscope and found that you know they employed a hook and loop system. He worked out a way to synthesize this and invented Velcro, which is now you know a massive invention stroke innovation. Now I say it's not directly linked because obviously he's an inquisitive mind with expertise and he wasn't looking for this, he's just happened upon it. But Louis Pasteur said, and I've written this down so I don't get it wrong, where observation is concerned, chance favours only the prepared mind. George de Mistral was prepared. He was open to see new things and have new ideas from them. Um, and that's what we're talking about here. Follow these tangents with view to the fact that if you come across something, you are now prepared to incorporate it or to take it on. So finally, um, in this kind of four stages, um, this one could be a bit uncomfortable, but incorporate expertise. It can be really difficult to admit that we're not an expert in everything. And I often see people having crisis of confidence through their journey when they start to bring other people in. They start to question what their value is. Um, my reassurance is always they wouldn't be there if it wasn't for you. The idea is still one of the biggest elements. Um, and the coordination of how you get through that idea is the strategic power that you bring. But the important part here is to remember that there are talented people that can provide expertise that you can't provide. And because of that, you can make best use of appropriate and available expertise to do the kind of maybe the next stage, which is that kind of validate, build, test and deliver stage. The bit where essentially it all comes together. And if you're doing that with expertise, while still following tangents, just in case, and while still incorporating other people's evaluation, socializing your idea, getting that contribution, you've got that really fulfilled model of how you take it forward um, and, and great governance structure as well. So 
what you end up with though, um, and by way of example, is if you do this, say with an academic institution, you could well see yourself creating something that not only has a bit of scientific rigor around it, so therefore it's a bit of a stamp of approval, which is great when you get to the market, but also it, you're testing your, you're reconciling that innovation idea that you had early on. You said, I have a problem. You said you were going to make this as a solution. You made it. Now, does it solve that problem? And does it solve the problem of everyone you were talking to as well? If you may, I'd like to um, illustrate some of what we've been talking about in uh, just a small case study. Um, a larger firm, so not necessarily the innovation that we've been talking about, but Fitbit, um, that probably everyone knows. A few years ago, um, Fitbit, the wearable tech company, um, looked to enter into the female health um, market, um, particularly with menstrual tracking. Now, they listened to their users, they surveyed, um, and a good basis for their, for their product features, good specification, you know, in-app logging, um, health info tagging, and comparison with other health data, and, and so on. The problem is, is when it got to um, release, um, and major release at that, um, the, the press really picked apart the product. Um, it'd been quite obvious um, from the outset after release that it was un underwhelming and underdeveloped. There were duration limits on, on periods, which users pointed out as inappropriate. There were condition limits, um, only limited to five, with, with one of them quite simply being sick. Um, and there was a real kind of sense that there was an inappropriate or maybe inaccessible um, UX, um, or, or rather UI in particular, around how this data was showed. So what does this really tell us about whether or not they followed what we've been talking about? Well, that kind of initial socialising, um, yes, that, that's obviously happened and they've responded to a, to a requirement. But the incorporation of expertise, and in this case, we have to assume women and medical health professionals, uh, you know, it would be quite easy to say that maybe they haven't done that all the way through and that they haven't worked iteratively seeking that kind of contribution and evaluation all the way through because otherwise, again, we have to assume that they wouldn't have gone to release. You know, they would have picked up the need for appropriate tagging, no limits, maybe user defined limits and so on. Now, we haven't talked about tangents here because there wasn't one, but there are potentials. Um, you know, if we take what we've been talking about and they were to look elsewhere in the medical health industry, they'd see that there's a, there's a, a lot of research and development about smart bandages and monitoring. Um, and in fact, there's a company and we can assume that this could have been our tangent. Um, Loon Cup looking at integrating sensors into menstrual devices for tracking progress. And, and again, that could only have added value to a product like this. So what can we do with all of this? Um, essentially, it's theory so far, but what can we do? Engage with your community, embed yourself in those communities. Tech Exeter, um, Digital Exeter, Tech Southwest and so on you know, really key, valuable pools of people that can help you along your journey. Engage with projects and institutions. Now, it's actually more obvious than you think. These institutions and projects are generally funded already. And so it's a chance for you to get hold of resources that you wouldn't be able to get hold of otherwise. Now, this can be everything from smart citizens down in Plymouth, the Impact Lab in Exeter, the Data Mill, Set Squared, of course, in, um, anything really that can give you access to that, those resources and people as well, those experts. Form links with peers. Fairly obvious one, and you would think that that's the community aspect, but this linkage is really one that's ongoing. So what I mean by this is once you establish that there are these groups that can help you along your journey, either put in place or join their communication mechanisms, you know, be it WhatsApp, forums, Slack channels, whatever's comfortable and accessible to you, because that's your chance to, to keep them there as a constant theme throughout your journey. And then a bit of repetition, but utilize resources. I've put this in here because I'm more talking about things that maybe aren't always there, be it going to technology expos, to see what the latest technology is, um, going to events to see what other people are doing, um, demo nights, pitch nights, things like that, where you can maybe even see what, what other people are doing, see how you can work off of it or get advice back from yours. 
there's a whole load of really valuable stuff that just happens all the time um, that you just need to keep your eye out for. Now, this isn't formal theory, of course. Um, I've talked about that right at the beginning, but but it is based on some um, kind of principles that are out there and recognized. I've just put a few of them up there just so that people can maybe see what's kind of influenced my understanding and also some credits as well. Um, and that's really the end. So um, if anyone would like to ask any questions, really looking forward to seeing you on the day um, and um, talking with you.